Welcome back, everyone. We're about to begin. On behalf of School of Fire Protection, Seneca residents, and the FPSA, it is my great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to witness this important fire safety demonstration. Please be sure to share your experiences today on social media with the hashtag LiveBurn2018 and at Seneca College. Today we have various representatives from the fire protection community visiting our campus, distinguished guests and supporters of the school, as well as senior executives from the Seneca College, several deans, program chairs, uh, professors, and other campus staff. I would like to take a moment to introduce Scott Paxley to everyone. He is the industry coordinator and a professor within the School of Fire Protection here at Seneca College. Scott will be leading the demonstration. All right, good morning, everyone. It's still morning. It feels like it's afternoon for the length of time that we've been preparing for this, but good morning, everyone, nevertheless. Um, this is our fourth year hosting uh, our live demonstration, and uh, I can safely say that uh, this is one of the most fun events to do all year. Uh, this rivals my favorite event, which is shaking students' hands on the convocation stage. It's 50-50 it's what's more fun. Uh, if we could light the convocation on stage, stage on fire, I think I could marry both of my favorite things together, but I don't think they're going to invite me back a second time. So uh, each year we have this opportunity to share our knowledge about fire safety and about public education, um, and it's really an important message for us to practice what we preach. As students of fire protection, you saw many of our students as we walked in carrying a, a fire fact sign. It's just good information and it's great to be able to be here to share this with as many people that are here. Uh, additionally, to all the guests that we uh, do have on campus for the, uh, for the day, I wanted to welcome the Ontario chapter of the Canadian Fire Alarm Association. Today we're helping host a educational symposium for them that's in the Great Hall. And with that, we've been able to integrate both events to have uh, their roughly 200 people join us uh, outside. Um, with all the different people who are here, I know it's a little bit of a cliche to say, but the most important people who are here are our students being able to witness something that could happen uh, tonight. God forbid, but this is something that is um, absolutely something that could happen. And we don't want to have, um, I just, I wouldn't know what to do with myself if there was ever a fire on campus. Honestly, I just, I would, I don't know what I'd do. So, now that I'm gonna get a little bit mobile, all right. So, all right. So, with, uh, with all the things that are going on, I want to just make sure that we can have a good look at what we are seeing here. Um, this series of burn cells have been set up to replicate two typical rooms. There's nothing unusual about them. Um, as I was doing a little bit of preparatory research for this, a couple things really stuck out in my mind. And I know that the, the consensus for most of us is that this will never happen to, uh, this will never happen to me. All right. Um, whether you know it or not, so far in Ontario alone, we've had 74 fire-related fatalities. So it's happening to people. We may not see it in the news necessarily, and I hope that we don't um, have to report ugly facts like that. But we've seen a 20% increase from last year. So the public education efforts that we're doing on a regular basis are super, super important, because with an increase of 20%, that's just tremendous. This is the 10th month and we've got 74 people. So I'm not a mathematician, but that's a lot a week, all right? That is just tremendous. And we've got to be very, very aware of that. And when the stats jump by 20%, um, we have a problem. And it could be us not being aware of simple fire protection concepts and, and simple things that we can do to, to certainly lessen the risk of uh, our, our self being coming uh, harm's way. So as we're looking at these two cells, um, they're, they're certainly staged, but they're not staged. All right, there's no accelerants being added. This is a, a bed that's been donated from Seneca residents. Inside, we've got a dresser, a small flat screen TV, and a chair, and some curtains. Well, the curtains match the comforter. That's because what we had. But this is all regular stuff. There's nothing else that's in there, nothing you would find differently in this particular room as you would anywhere else, okay? Uh, the plexiglass that we're seeing at the front of both cells is really just help to replicate an enclosed wall and it also lets us look inside really, really easily. So um, it's gonna get hot, it's gonna get really, really smoky without not being too windy right now. Most of it's gonna go straight up and we'll be in great shape. You're gonna notice one is protected, one is non-protected. The one that is not protected has a brand new smoke alarm installed. 
By not protected, I want to make sure that it's just it doesn't have a fire sprinkler within it. The one that is not protected has a smoke alarm. The one that is fire sprinkler protected by the great sign does have both a, a smoke alarm as well as a sprinkler head. And we'll do a comparison between the both of them. All right. So we're going to, uh, during, the, the, during the process of our burn, we're going to call out some temperatures of the ceilings. Uh, those temperatures are going to be a little bit of an abstract number for many of you because you won't know quite what they, uh, you're not going to quite know what those uh, numbers all mean. So to put it in a sense of perspective for you, you're going to first start feeling pain on your, on your body when the temperature gets around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. As the temperature rises and rises around 118, you're going to feel first degree burns. 130 is uh, second degree burns. Now, the temperatures we're going to be reading off here very shortly are going to be way above that. So from a perspective of when's it going to, when am I going to feel it, you're going to feel the heat on your face and it's lit. So with the side that is uh, non-protected, it's lit. We've got a smoke alarm activation. We're seeing the, the fire go up the back wall. The products of combustion are naturally being uh, created. So we've got hydrogen gases, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. It doesn't take too long, folks, for this to get growing. We've got 100 degrees right off the bed. Early activation with a smoke alarm. From a time standpoint, we're looking at less than 40 seconds. We've got about 150 degrees at the bed. And now we have a fire sprinkler operate. At the seat of the fire, we're now at 350 degrees. Less than a minute, folks. We've already got flash over. The ceiling temperatures are now in excess of 500. It's dancing around on us, but we're around five or 600 degrees Fahrenheit. That is what flash over occurs. Now, the ceiling temperatures within the room are greatly reduced because now all of that water is being applied to the fire area. A minute and 15 seconds now. We do not have an opportunity to get out of this room. Eight hundred degrees, eight fifty at the ceiling. Eight hundred and fifty degrees. So we had a response from our uh, on-campus uh, firefighters uh, in a minute and 30 seconds, a uh, minute 37 if I'm reading that correctly. Uh, a typical fire department would have a response time of uh, seven to eight minutes. So if you think of the size of this room, what is a little bit smaller than what you might have in your own home, I want you to give some thought to how fast that grew in size and how large it would have been by the time the first responding fire apparatus is uh, on scene. So while this is happening, we're still getting cooling. If you do a compare and contrast from fire hose to sprinkler head, a typical fire hose is going to deliver about 250 gallons a minute. Sprinkler head for what we have in this room is doing about 13 gallons a minute. So while it looks like there's a lot of water there, it's actually not. At the base of the fire, we're now, or the base of the room rather, it's not a fire any longer. We're just in the range of about 70 degrees. So when a fire sprinkler operates, there is often an alarm that rings at a security station. That security station then alerts the area fire department, and that fire department would then be dispatched. Using the response times that we were describing before, they would be responding in about another four or five Fox. minutes. And for a fire that grew that fast in that size, we really don't have much of a choice. We have to be able to get out as fast as possible. It was great that we heard the smoke alarm for a period of time. But I do want to point out that after a while, so I'm letting it flow longer so we can see the volume of water on the floor compared to the other one. We're seeing it's much less. So now let's just sort of pretend that the fire department's arrived and we're going to have them go in and do some typical salvage and overhaul. So if I start to use terms that you're unfamiliar with, let me clarify that now. Salvage and overhaul would be when the fire service arrives, they want to make sure that they can find the source and the location of the fire, and they try to do some overhaul to expose the seat of the fire, find out what is on, uh, what the burning material might be, applied water directly to it, 
And before the fire sprinkler is turned off, we want to make sure that we know where it is. Okay, everyone, that was uh, awfully dramatic. Did you ever expect this being so fast and go over to the flashover already? Uh, so I guarantee you don't want this happening in your own home. Let's take a look of some quick fire facts. So do you know that 45% of fatal fires occur between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m.? That being said, a fire safety plan and working smoke alarm are critical for your safety. That just imagine that you're on your warm bed in the middle of winter, and what will wake you up in the middle of night? Smoke alarms. So you really want to have a working smoke alarms in your own home. A smoke detector that has an old battery or that has been removed due to cooking will not save you. It is very important to test and change the batteries within your smoke detector along with checking the date in which you need to replace the whole unit. And also this year, uh, FP, an, an FPA Fire Prevention Week has the theme, look, listen, learn. Be aware, fire can happen anywhere. Look, look for places fire could start. Take a good look about your own home, identify potential fire hazards and address them. If necessary, have a qualified professional correct hazards. Listen, listen for the sound of smoke alarm. You could only have minutes to escape safely once the smoke alarm sounds just as uh, Scott Pesley just mentioned. Then go to your outside meeting places. Learn. Learn two ways out of every room and make sure all doors and windows leading outside are safe and, safe and open easily and free of clutter. Thanks very much, Emma. So as Emma was describing, the importance of having a smoke alarm in every room is obviously something we're trained on, right? This was something I picked up at Costco for about 20, 20 25 bucks. They're on sale. I bought a bunch of them because we're going to do these a lot more often, so I bought them on sale. Um, we have to make sure that we're, we have a, an active smoke alarm, a new battery. We're changing them on the manufacturer's suggested cycle, so you can buy smoke alarms that have a 10-year battery. You change them every 10 years. You can, if you have a conventional one like what we see here, uh, we're suggesting every, every time change, right? And that's something we we're taught from a very, very young age. What surprised me, if you uh, listen to the spot that was on CTV News a little while ago, um, this was a smoke alarm that came out of my mother's house. She had a brand new, you know, the really, really good, without being brand specific, a really, really good battery in here. But this detector is 15 years old. Um, and she was so adamant that she was doing the right thing. Brand new battery in an old detector. It doesn't work. All right? It doesn't work at all. Worsely, worsely if that's a word, worse off. Uh, this was another one that I found in her home. I replaced six during that visit. I think my trip cost her a little bit of money. But uh, this one has a 1998 date on it with a brand new battery that was good for another six years. So what I was very surprised that I had neglected my own family in, in a lot of the fire protection uh, discussions that I do. So please, if you get lots of things out of this demonstration today, get one extra thing, go home, check your detectors. But for those students that are in the room, check your parents. Show them what their education is paying for and check theirs, climb up on a ladder, get some help, and make sure that they're having a, an appropriate uh, detector, sorry, an appropriate alarm with the right battery and we're treating these things very seriously because in a minute and a half, we don't have that time, all right? Fires are growing faster and faster and it's not because we're being careless, but it's because with all the synthetic materials, they are just that, they're burning that much faster. There's more fuel there. Um, for those of you who are here for the demonstration, that would really conclude, it, conclude the demonstration. Please take an opportunity, walk up front, have a good look at things. If you can find or look at the burnt cell and see if you can see the smoke alarm, have a good look between the two of them. This is now safe for you to walk around. Just please do not go inside the cells. Thanks, everyone, and I hope to see you at our next live burn. But remember, check your smoke alarms. Fire protection does start with you.